Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the Mining Podcast. And today's guest is Dominic Roberts, Head of Corporate Affairs at Adriatic Metals, um, who are a precious and base metals explorer and developer that owns the world-class Varsa Silver Project, which I hope I've pronounced that correct, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the Raska Zinc Deposit in Serbia. Um, with a military background, Dominic's going to talk about um, and go deep, sort of deep into mining within the Balkans and how mining changed in the region for the better. Um, and it has a, a certainly has a bright future ahead. So let's get straight into this and that's welcome Dominic to the podcast. How you doing Dominic? Hey Rob, yeah, good to talk to you. Thank you for inviting me on. And look, the, uh, it's, it's not the uh, easiest area of pronunciation. Um, the project's called Varish. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, but don't worry, I've been working there all my life on and off and um, I still struggle every now and again with it, but we'll get there. Yeah, we'll okay. get there. So, so um, yeah, so appreciate your time as well, coming onto the, the podcast and um, giving us your insight to the area. So obviously how we always kick this, uh, they kick these podcasts off. I wonder if you can give the uh, audience a um, brief background of yourself. Obviously you're in the military. Um, so you can give us a, a quick overview of that and what you've been doing in mining to sort of present day. And then um, then I've got a, a number of questions I want to ask. No, thank you. And, and actually, you know, the, the, the military bit is interesting because that's when I first went to the Balkans. Uh, so as a 21 year old second lieutenant in the British Army, I was deployed to Bosnia in 1995 and uh, fell in love with the country and fell in love with the region then. Uh, I saw what I still see today, which is a beautiful part of the world quite often misunderstood due to its complicated history, quite often demonized again due to its history, but somewhere actually I've fallen very deeply in love with. And, and therefore when I left the army, I took, took away the sort of the core project management skills. Uh, and, you know, frankly, my job was to make difficult things happen in difficult places. And I recognized an industry whereby the core competency is actually to make difficult things happen in difficult places. And the crossovers are huge, but You've had uh, uh, other talkers on the show before who've gone into the detail on that, and, and I echo nearly all of the points that were brought up before. I think that was incredibly spot on. Uh, so I've been working now in the Balkans for the last 15 years uh, in the natural resources sector. Uh, started off actually by a piece of serendipity where I got involved in a waste reclamation project in Croatia, which involved me in, actually in the end commissioning a huge gravity retreatment plant, uh, successfully put it into operation, and then from that actually went across uh, and spent nearly eight years with the largest privately owned, in fact, the largest miner in the Balkans, a company called Minico. And I rose up through the ranks to become chief operating officer there with direct operational responsibility for five polymetallic mines in both Bosnia and Serbia. Uh, and indeed also uh, the successful permitting of the first new mine in Bosnia uh, for a or first new base metal mine in Bosnia for a generation. And then taking those skills, I was delighted to join the Adriatic team in the summer of this year, who are exactly where I've been before. We are permitting Varish. Uh, Varish is a world-class base metal project or base and precious metal project. And I'm really delighted at having the opportunity of bringing across the experience that I've already had from doing a smaller mine, albeit just down the road into what is actually a much, much bigger mine and having another, another turn at it. Um, and it, 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 I've worked extensively across the region, obviously Bosnia and Serbia directly with the mines, but I've also reviewed projects and looked at prospects in Kosovo, Albania, Montenegro, Macedo Macedonia, and across the whole of the, the Tefian belt. So, and the reason I wanted to come on today actually was to, to, to take this opportunity to talk to your listeners and just explain a little bit more about why increasingly, I think the Balkans are not only an important area for us to be looking at in terms of our future access to primary resources, but also an, an attractive jurisdiction and one that, that, that we should be considering uh, and we should be paying note of what the developments are there because there's a lot more to happen in my opinion. Yes, certainly. Yeah. And I suppose it's um, a bit of a hidden unknown as well, unless you're someone like yourself that has been in and around this whole region for, a num for obviously a number of years. So um, obviously the Balkans are not predominantly known for mining, um, I wonder if you can just give us a an is history of, of obviously uh, of the region. Uh, yeah, you're right. They're not. I mean, predominantly they're known for other things. Uh, and actually, you know, part of my job, part of my company's job, and our industry is to change that narrative because there is a there is a different narrative for the future in the region. And it is actually it is going to be one about providing primary resources into 
uh, the European, European manufacturing base, and it's going to increasingly be seen as a really important part of Europe's circular economy aspirations of the future. But, you know, you know I'd say I've worked there all my life. Uh, those of us who know the region uh, know that there's been mining since antiquity. Um, mm. uh, from the, the Romans through to the Saxons, through to the Austro-Hungarians, uh, even the Brits, uh, Selection Trust, which was the precursor to British Petro Petroleum, actually opened the mines, the Trepture mines in Kosovo. Uh, and then we moved to the wars. World War II was rather interesting. The Germans, uh, our army, uh, whilst it was moving across to seize strategic oil fields in Romania, which they desperately needed to keep the war effort going, they also hooked down to the south uh, to take hold of a mine called Stan Turg Mine in Kosovo. And Stan Turg Mine is still operating today. But in the Second World War, that played a vital part in producing the lead that actually then went into the batteries that kept the Wolfpack, the submarines going in the North Atlantic. So again, a, a, an interesting aside, but part of that history. But then we, and I, and I think there's another thing. I learned a new word the other day, Rob, called uh, toponym. Okay. You heard that word? No, I haven't. Uh, nor would I. A toponym is a, is, a, is a place name that's linked to the activity of that place. So. Okay. And the Balkans could have invented that. They love literal names. And to give you some example of the depth of the history of the mining, we have Srebrenica, which means city of silver. And you know, we think that the Romans got their gold and silver out of Spain because Hollywood sort of directed us that way with number of films. They didn't. They hopped on a boat. They went across the Adriatic. It was a short, short trip for them. And their gold and silver, they, it came out the Balkans. Uh, Srebrenica, city of silver. Just up the road from Srebrenica, there's a mine called Sasa. Sasa means Saxon in local language, another toponym. Uh, Central Asian Metals, uh, Nick, Nick Clark's team yeah. brought another Sasa mine in Macedonia. Uh, the mine I opened in Bosnia was called Olivo. The town was called Olivo. Olivo means lead. And even Adriatic's Varish project, Varish actually refers to a piece of wrought iron because there was a strong mining history there in the, in, in the iron industry. But I think the important historical area to look at is then actually the impact of Yugoslavia. Uh, post-World War II. And Yugoslavia was a, a, communist, a communist state, but critically it was, it was a non-aligned state. It wasn't wholly aligned with the Soviet Union. It wasn't part of uh, a fundamental part of the Eastern Bloc. And as a non-aligned state, Yugoslavia actually had to produce nearly all of its requirements from its internal resources. Uh, they couldn't trade on the international markets. The cost of the dollar was too high for them. The foreign exchange rates were too high. So within their planned economy, they actually had to produce 90% of what they were going to use in the country. And that manifested itself actually in a really strong relationship between the natural resources, the smelting of them, turning them to metals, putting those metals into the heavy, heavy industry that then produced their own automotives, their own uh, industrial equipment, whatever else it might be. And so throughout that period of the planned economy, you actually saw a large expansion of the natural resources uh, operations in Yugoslavia. And they also, they were social enterprises. The planned economy had to give every single person a job and mines are quite often located up in the mountains in the Balkans where there wasn't an obvious recourse to other employment. So mines became a really important part of, of this planned economy. And that actually filters out into where we are today in some very important ways, which I'll cover later on. We then had a. Sorry, uh, I, was just, no, I was just saying, so, you know, over the 80s, the uh, economic situation deteriorated. It then led to the civil war, the breakup of Yugoslavia, uh, and the fledgling states uh, that, that fell out of that war. And a sort of period during the 1990s when the Balkans was again in the shadows a little bit, um, particularly Serbia, which is the large, largest country in the region, and it will be again the economic powerhouse uh, in the region. Serbia throughout the 1990s couldn't really decide whether it was going to lean towards the east or to the west. There was really no foreign investment at all in the region during that period. Into the 2000s, when actually Serbia did decide it would start to look towards the west, some international started to come. And then I think it all really started with a guy called Simon Ingram and a company called Reservoir. And Reservoir Minerals uh, found the enormous copper porphyry project sitting underneath an established historical mine and then it went off to Freeport to Nevson and now finally it's with Xinjin the Chinese giant who are now developing that project but that success of reservoir in a period of time in the commodities market when there wasn't much good news going on in the world really caught people's imaginations and there was a period in the sort of 20, 2012 to 2015 where every flight going into Belgrade had a geologist from a Canadian junior coming in to look to peg another bit of land so that's when our profile did start to, to rise at that stage and 
uh, fast forward today, we have got majors there developing minds. We've got a number of juniors exploring. Uh, that news flow is starting to pick up, but I still think it's a region that, the, that, that there is room for some more knowledge and education about. Yeah, certainly. Um, I wonder if you can describe the potential for mining, obviously, in the in the uh, region. Obviously, you mentioned there, there has been in the past a lot of um, junior miners going into the going into the area. Um, what are the uh, opportunities from a practical, practical and economic uh, standpoint? Actually, I, th I think the, the principal uh, opportunity is, in fact, the one that, that we're all looking for, which is the geological opportunity. Uh, the Balkans is incredibly well endowed with the mineral resources. Uh, you know, we know that from history. Uh, we know that from the work that's going on now. And increasingly, we're starting to see the results of that. Look, we sit on the Tethian belt. For which again that's something that people are becoming more and more aware about it extends really down from actually we we at adriatic are at the top of it with our varish project and then it extends southeast down bosnia serbia kosovo albania bulgaria across a bit to the east and then down towards greece and i think increasingly the international mining community is realizing that the tethian belt has got a lot more to offer um, but the opportunity there actually lies in the historical work there's hardly a square meter of the Balkans that someone hasn't walked over. Uh, everywhere you go, there is historical workings, there's scratching on the surface from either the Saxons or indeed the Romans. Uh, there's a mine in Kosovo called Artana that's been in continuous operation since 250 AD. It's still, still <laughs> running. Okay. But the point here is that actually, whilst there was extensive mapping, there was extensive looking at surface mineralization, uh, there was very little there has you know there's been very little application of modern exploration techniques and there is a huge opportunity here yugoslavia uh, under the planned economies i keep referring back to had to get access to natural resources and there was so much of it at surface and at shallow depths that actually we've got ourselves into a system of the planned economy where mm. we always got to the minimum economic resources required to open a mine to employ people to feed primary resources into the system and there were lots of different options for that and Yugoslavia was able to exploit those but we didn't need to during that period we didn't need to drill at depth we didn't need to drill thousands of meters because there was so much surface mineralization that we left it and you'll find across the Balkans continuous examples of mines that were opened with drilling only down to 2 250 meters from surface the Yugoslavians were very keen on putting exploration adits into the ore body uh, and they did that for two reasons. One, because the reporting, reporting codes uh, locally required you to have a lot of what we would call measured, or in their case, A-class reserves. And the only way to find those, the 15% one used to need to get a, a geological statement was to put an adit in. But also the Yugoslavians considered those adits actually to be the precursor to the exploitation because actually they had an awful lot of success. Most of the places they looked at deploying a mine, they did. And so why not? go to the expense of putting an adit in because you're pretty confident in the future that'll be your decline, your, your transport access to the mine. But therein lies the enormous opportunity that actually because of that surface effect, because of the shallow drilling, because of uh, the, 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 there wasn't a need to look down at depth, uh, we see countless examples of where you do go down dip, where you do follow this down depth, we find more and more ore. And we're seeing, you know, we see that with what happened in Bohr, Reservoir Minerals, enormous co uh, copper porphyry, world-class deposit, was sitting underneath a mine that had been operating for 150 years. Uh, you know, my last company actually I added uh, two and a half million tons on balance in the space of about six months by just drilling underneath the current workings because we hadn't done that before. And there's there's countless other examples. So I think it's I think the fundamental opportunity is that front end, the geological opportunity provided by the lack of modern exploration technique. Uh, provided by the huge amount of mineralization that is present in the reason in, in our part of the world i mean it's probably the same in the rest of the world but i'm a balkan specialist but the best place to find a new mine in the balkans is an old mine and the best place to find that new mine is invariably underneath the old mine and to track it down uh, and, and to put those meters in on the drill rods uh, that hadn't been put in before and then the final very important aspect of that as well, another Euro Yugoslavian legacy is that the Yugoslavs needed industrial base metals. They did not explore, they didn't even assay for gold and silver uh, on their core when it came out. And we're seeing that with some of the work of the juniors now in the region, but I think there is enormous precious metals uh, potential there as well, because there has been almost zero exploration of that for the last 50, 60 years. And then prior to that, it was the work done by I say the old empires and the Austrians and the Saxons and from the Serbians.
So and I think that's the that, that's the predominant opportunity that is there for us. Yeah, um, I've got a couple of questions which are probably all uh, related. How does the concession system work in the Balkans? Um, and what are the differences between sort of Bosnia and Serbia from obviously a mining perspective? Um, and how easy, easy is it to meet the local uh, permitting requirements? <laughs> we're, we're right in the middle of that at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think um, it, it's a very good question. And it's, it's one that is actually, it's quite difficult to understand if you're not very close to it, um, because the regulations are different across the countries. Um, Bosnia particularly has a peculiarity in that, and actually this is a rather interesting one, it's actually, it fell out of what we call the Dayton Accords. Uh, uh, and the Dayton Accords were really how the civil war ended in 1994-95, and it was the international community uh, imposed uh, on the country uh, a set of legislation and, and how that new country would be formed of Bosnia-Herzegovina. But within that, there was a, there was a, a room for concessions. And the, and the reason they did that, actually, was to, to allow a sort of economic stimulus at the start, whereby previously state-owned assets could be concessioned off very quickly to the private industry, so we could start to build the economy. But the interesting legacy of that is that that's also counts for geological exploration. So Bosnia is rather unique in the sense that one actually has to buy a concession for exploration. And, and that is why Adriatic are the only public company operating in Bosnia, because we're the only people that actually saw through the concession system to something that was significant, substantially attractive enough to go through the really rather large upfront payment that people in the rest of the world aren't used to do. So in Bosnia, one has to apply for a concession. Uh, and then if you're awarded the concession, there is an, a, a, an upfront cost, which in, uh, our, there's another complication here that Bosnia has three levels of government, municipal, cantonal, and then federal. And concession law is at the cantonal level. And our concession fee at the cantonal level started off at 0.15 BAM, the local currency. So that's 75 cents per square meter. So if you're paying nearly a euro per square meter to have the right to conduct exploration works, you need to be very, very certain that you've got something at the end of it because your upfront payment is going to be millions. And you know, this is where Adriatic actually was so successful because through going through the historical archives in an incredibly detailed way, they identified a very tight land package sitting over a very prospective area and therefore could take that financial commitment of paying an upfront cost because they were so sure of what was there and you know, the rest is history, it is there. Uh, but that concession agreement system has, I think, prevented uh, the international community from entering Bosnia particularly because unlike the rest of the world, you do have to pay upfront for the risk, for the expiration risk. And I was gonna, sorry, just interrupt there. It, I, I imagine it'd be pretty hard for an international company to go into that region because they probably wouldn't understand necessarily the, the laws and the way to do business within those countries, which as you've been speaking, it's, it is a lot different. So you would need that expertise on the ground, like for instance, yourself that's been there for, for quite a few years and obviously different roles and being in the military. So I'd imagine it would be hard for a, a, a newcomer into that region to sort of pick things up and actually understand uh, understand what is required. So you would need someone local on the ground that completely understands the whole system, the processes to get things moving. Yeah, yeah, absolutely you do. Um, and I, going back to my point, you know, I, I think that's why Adriatic, uh, we're the only public company in Bosnia because <clears throat> we did see through that, we did see the potential and we did bring in you know, on board the local team of experts, uh, our legal team who could help us navigate through that. And, and of course, you know, it's an interesting point here because this, this is the sort of first mover advantage. Um, and we were the first public mover in the country. Uh, we have had that advantage. Uh, increasingly, I think the work we've done is probably going to provide more competition in the future as people see what we have been able to do despite you know, the problems of uh, the concession agreement. I, I, I think also you know, the, the government has recognized this. Um, and later on in the life of the Adriatic uh, story, uh, in fact, this year, we took on a substantially increased concession area of 32 square kilometres. Now, if we'd paid the original concession fee, that would have cost us millions of euros just to buy the right to explore for that land. But we managed to discuss with government and actually explain to them that you need, you know, this needs to be liberalised. If you want people to come here, 
<clears throat> if you want people to start deploying mines, start to uh, develop the, the economic potential of the country through the natural resources sector, you, we're going to have to change this up. And we did in that agreement manage to renegotiate and we went down to a payment of 75 euros a hectare, uh, which was a, I mean, a complete difference uh, and very much de-risked it. But in return, we agreed to increase the royalty that we would pay in the future. So it was a sort of that transfer of, of risk a little bit, uh, the working with the government in a more transparent way to say, look, give us the opportunity to spend money to explore. And, uh, and in return, we will try our hardest to build a mine. And then in return, you will actually generate more longer term fees from the royalty system from doing that. And they, they've got that. So you know, we saw that, we've seen that sort of concept. And so that is just a yeah. cut in there. If because of that's happened with you guys, if another company wants to come in, do you think they could then negotiate not paying that upfront fee and reducing that upfront fee and obviously increasing royalties? Or is it because you're you've been there, you understand, and you, you've obviously been in the region for, for a longer time and you they've they know you and they trust you, hence the reason why they've given you that uh, sort of leeway. I think there's, it's a good question actually. I, I think there is still a little bit of a legacy suspicion in some places around what international investors' motives are, <clears throat> you know, whether we're, we're actually here to exploit and to take out as many as many dollars that could be going to the exchequer as, as possible. Um, and I, I think you're right. I think part of that is actually that, that Adriatic had demonstrated over the three or four years before we got this, these different conditions that we were serious, that we were mm -hmm. absolutely committed to this project. They'd seen the amount of drilling we've done. They've seen the way in which we develop the team. Uh, they've actually, really importantly, they've, they've seen the sort of ESG focus that we've put in place. Uh, the fact that we're actually doing an internationally compliant ESIA, even above and beyond the local requirements. And I think all of those things sort of built up together into a sort of reassurance of government that they could take this, this risk from stepping away from what had been the norm before to give us that. Because I think you're right. I think we had created the conditions for them to trust us. Yeah. Uh, so whether that's an automatic assumption that that would go to someone else coming into the region, you know, or into Bosnia particularly, whether they would have to also demonstrate that. But I certainly think it is a step that we have taken towards that liberalisation of the market. And, you know, as I said, I, you know, I love the region very dearly. I want to see it develop. It needs economic development. And, you know, I'd like to think that this is a, a, a step down that route. But I, I think the point here, Bosnia is a bit unique in terms of the concession. The rest of the region, uh, particularly Serbia, uh, is what we're talking about today, actually has a, a, a sort of exploration license system that we're more used to in the rest of the world. It's slightly more standard. Uh, the terminology might be more different, but broadly, people would come in and look at it and understand it. We, it's, it's first come, first, for, first uh, served. Mm -hmm. Uh, use it or lose it, no ability to overpeg. So a, mo a more sort of obvious exploration <laughs> process that, that people would feel comfortable with. And that is why in Serbia particularly, you know, we've got a dozen or so juniors and majors operating in the country because it is so much more transparent and it is so much more clearer how uh, a company can progress from exploration to exploitation. Yeah. And how's the existing uh, infrastructure in these regions um, and how is that going to benefit uh, the projects that you're obviously involved in? Actually, Rob, I might just move back because we, we didn't quite capture the end of the last I, question. Okay. <laughs> never, it's all right, but, but it's really important, um, which is actually about permitting. Um, and that is an incredibly important issue, and it's one Adriatic are dealing with at the moment in terms of permitting the Varish uh, project. Um, and this is a, you know, this is a reality for international companies coming into the Balkans is that we, we do actually have to work to the local uh, laws and to the local mining codes and to the local routes to success and to opening a mine. And I always really rather look at it as if there's a sort of twin track railway here. You've got what we need to do within the local codes and the local regulation to re ultimately receive what we call the usage permit, i.e the right to operate a mine in the future and the steps one has to go down along that part of the railway line. And then we've got on top of that, of course, the steps that we have to follow uh, compliant to the international financial systems to achieve the finance and the ability to you know, develop the mine on the base of the finance. And of course, that top track is linked to the IFC, in our case, actually very much to EBRD because EBRD are a shareholder of Adriatic and they set the sort of the, what they call the performance requirements, but fundamentally the standards we need to achieve to get international finance. And so we've got these two train tracks and the skill here for the operator uh, 
is to actually run those together and to understand how you can take the detailed engineering from the internationally compliant work and translate that. And I don't mean translate from English to Serbian or English to Bosnian. I mean, translate that to a fit and adjust to the local code uh, so that you can run those two simultaneously. And you need to pay a lot of attention to this. This is something that, 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 that companies will fail on if they are not on top of this requirement. Um, I mean, as I say, I mean, I'm fortunate I've done that before uh, and therefore I've, uh, you know, I've got the experience of doing that and, I, and I'm taking that into the Adriatic team and what we're doing at the moment. But it, it is a very important reality of working in the region. So you know, there are lots of great advantages. Uh, the geological potential uh, infrastructures, we'll come on to some of them later on, but some of the cons are is that one does need to understand uh, the local context and how to work with that. But fundamentally, you can do it. Uh, I've done it before. Uh, others have done it in other parts of the region. We can permit and we can permit successfully. Uh, you know, we've got a, a government that fundamentally wants us to permit, uh, and I'll probably talk about that later a little bit more as well. It's just that one has to be very, very clear from the outset of, of what the differences are and how you're going to navigate them during your journey to both finance and permit. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as I just mentioned, obviously, the, the, the next question is around the, the uh, infrastructure in, the, in these regions. Um, so what is the infrastructure like around, obviously, some of the projects that you're involved in um, and how that's, how that's actually going to benefit the, the projects? I, I think this is a this is a huge advantage, uh, and you know I, I haven't worked in Australia or in South America or in the Ring of Fire up in Canada, but um, I can't imagine how how difficult it is there when you've got to run roads across permafrost for hundreds of kilometres or drive high high voltage electricity across hundreds of kilometres or pump water up thousands of metres up into the semi arid desert of the high mountains in South America because we don't have that problem. Uh, you're never more than ten kilometres from a sealed road. Uh, anywhere in the Balkans, frankly. Uh, you are never more than 10 kilometers away from existing high voltage electricity. Uh, Yugoslavia did many things incredibly well. Infrastructure was one of them. Uh, every community had road, had electricity, had telecommunications. We've got mobile reception up all of the deepest, darkest valleys up in the mountains. And we really benefit from fantastic infrastructure across the whole of the region. So it, it is not something that is, it is just isn't on our risk register. It just doesn't sit there as a massive concern to ours. And allied to the fact that actually in our part of the world, we are very, very good at concrete. We're good at civils, we're good at steel. We do it cheaply, quickly and efficiently. And therefore where we do need to extend a road by a few Ks, our guys are in there and they do it at a pace and a cost that everyone else in the rest of the world will be incredibly jealous about. I think also, uh, you know, again, that, that applies to railroad. Uh, in Adriatic's case, both of our projects, Farish and Rashka, have railheads at the mine site that will take concentrates in the future all the way down to deep water established ports in the Adriatic and off to our end users. Electricity, Bosnia, most of the electricity comes from hydro. It is very cheap. Uh, another advantage that we bring through uh, in, in, you know, in, into our operating costs, as well as those ones I've talked about, about our capex. But in infrastructure, I think, covers quite a few. There's, there's other aspects to that as well. Is, um, we also benefit from an excellent education system. Uh, we benefit from actually really talented young men and women who, interestingly, at the moment, they take their education uh, and because there aren't enough jobs available in the region, they go up to Northern Europe, they go up to Austria or to Germany. Uh, but if we can create the jobs, which they want locally and give them an opportunity to deploy their education, they'll leap at that chance. And I actually see that and the availability of staff uh, and the, you know, the, the, the impact or rather the, the, the depth of the level of English as a second language in the region is part of the sort of infrastructure attractiveness uh, to it. And of course also, you know, we're on mainland continental Europe. Uh, we sit on the European transport corridors. Uh, it's very easy to get to in terms of flights. Uh, you know, Varish project is 50 minutes up from Sarajevo airport, which is connecting straight into hubs all over Europe. So I, I think, again, infrastructure is a really important part to, to, to consider when you look at the Balkans, especially when you compare it to you know, some of the other mining jurisdictions where infrastructure is a massive upfront issue uh, at the start of the, of the project. And what about, and sort of moving on from that, what about the local communities? How well are you received in these particular jurisdictions and how, how do they react to you? Are they pretty friendly? Are, you, uh, are they welcoming you? Do you have any resistance? Um, or because these areas have been mining in the past, they sort of understand and get it? Spot on. 
I mean, I think that that what, what at the end of the sentence there, they get it. Mm. And it links back to what I've been talking to you, Rob. Um, you know, the, the, the Yugoslavian legacy, the planned economy, people understood, fu the fundamentally understood the link between primary resources uh, and industrial output. They got it. You know, I think lots of us up in Northwest Europe perhaps have lost that link. You know, I think there's a lot of us that fundamentally don't understand that if we want an iPhone 14, we actually need someone to be digging out rare earths in Scandinavia or wherever it else is. And we're a bit, I, we're a bit I, detached from that concept. I think a lot of the Western world is. The first, yeah. uh, Western world and first world countries, um, apart from people within the mining industry, obviously understand it and maybe provide services into the mining industry, understand it. But the average person doesn't. No, but we're... The average person is starting to realise that. We'll, we'll, we'll come on to that later, perhaps. But fundamentally, uh, we find in, in the region that people understand uh, natural resources. They understand critically that natural resources mean jobs. <clears throat> and they actually get that link between uh, not only the direct jobs in the mine, but the uh, indirect jobs from the suppliers, from the supply chain, uh, from the people contracted to the mine, but also they get uh, the spin-off. Uh, jobs that are created by the wealth that just comes into the area. And if you look at the two, two uh, communities I'm working at the moment, Barish and Rashka, these were both mining communities. They consider themselves to be mining communities. When you enter Barish, the first thing you see is a statue of a miner uh, dominating the road on the way into the town. On the flag of the municipal council, there is the crossed uh, uh, pickaxe and shovel uh, in mm. the color of green. Mm. The green was the mining color. They really do get that. And when mining stopped in Barish in the late 1980s, uh, it had a population of 30,000 people. Today, it has an official population of 6,000 and an unofficial probably 4,000 because of the impact of the end of the mine. So that was a very long answer of saying that actually we are blessed with uh, broadly supportive communities, people who understand mining. They understand its part in the whole industrial chain. But that doesn't mean we can be complacent. Uh, you know, it is incredibly important for us to work with those communities. Uh, and I think you know, there is an awareness where before historically they had no choice to voice their opinion about the mine or to voice their concerns about uh, health or about water. Mm -hmm. Now they do have a choice and quite rightly so. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's been a massive part of the ESG framework uh, from the very start. And it's guided every decision and action was to take the communities along on that journey. So we've, we've got their support, but we've got to maintain it. We've got to keep that open and transparent dialogue going with them. Uh, and, you know, we see that uh, we are being permitted. We've had environmental permits issued. Uh, we've had public consultations for the mining permits as well. And the feedback is, is continue doing the right job, continue, uh, continue reassuring us, continue talking to us, and we will support you. So we're very blessed with that. And I, I think that actually extends broadly all the way to political as well. There is a lot of political will for mining in the region. Uh, in Serbia, Mr. Vucic uh, announced a couple of years ago that 5% of the GDP will come mm. from mining. Uh, and that is, you know, that's a big statement. Mm. And it is one that then of course resonates down through the rest of government in the way in which the ministries support us. Um, I think it is, uh, you know, with that mining history, of course, also comes another aspect that there is actually quite a lot of mining expertise. There are still, there's always been operating mines, uh, even throughout the civil war and into the sort of that shadow I talk about in the nineties. What we need to do is just update uh, some of our practices. We, we, we lost touch with some of the rest of the world for a period of time. And now, you know, through the involvement of countries like companies like Adriatic, uh, like Rio Tinto, uh, Dundee across in Bulgaria, Zinjin as well, and some others, we are now starting to bridge that gap from the historical expertise that had always been there to the sort of bringing the first world expertise. But I sort of include that as part of the, the, the friendliness of the jurisdiction. We, we have miners as well as having people that understand and appreciate mining. Yeah. Um, from your perspective, what would you say the economic conditions are for developers that are coming into the uh, area? Pretty attractive. Um, we're in uh, a region of low corporation tax. Uh, in Bosnia, it's 10%. Uh, in Serbia, it's 15, Kosovo also 10%. Uh, you know, so there's an attractive upfront start to any potential uh, investment there, the, the tax, uh, taxation regime in these countries. You know, and that's allied to where they are in terms of their uh, uh, developing the economy, trying to encourage uh, uh, 
uh, economic growth through those low tax uh, uh, regimes. Um, royalties in Bosnia, the royalty we're paying in Varish is an effective 0.85%. Uh, you know, you look, look across our global peers and there'll be a lot of people rather jealous uh, to see that. Although there's an interesting point there is we also do recognize that, that there's actually peculiar potential for a bit of a threat from the low royalty is that, you know, you could see a, a situation in the future whereby the local communities are saying, well, you know, frankly, we're not getting enough back from this. Uh, and, and we get that. Uh, and actually, certainly at Adriatic, we, we, we're really aware of that. And we've set up something called the Adriatic Foundation which is a, a charitable independent organization where we're going to funnel a proportion of the company's profits into that foundation to sort of bridge that gap a bit by investing alongside government in education, environment and health matters to start just to share a little bit more of the success of the mine with the local community that perhaps makes up for the fact that the, you know, we are aware that the royalty rate isn't particularly uh, high in that jurisdiction. Um, I think also, uh, where we are, uh, pre-EU accession, uh, uh, we've got very uh, very competitive labour rates, uh, and they certainly play through into our operating costs, uh, and it makes a big difference to, to the profitability of a mine. I think those will change in the future, uh, and we expect those to, and we're very aware of that. Um, I think also, like I said earlier, infrastructure, uh, the ability of our excellent local contractors to do civils, concrete, steel at, at prices that are just incomparable to the rest of Western Europe or indeed the rest of the world, cheap electricity, uh, and, and all of those added together actually make it a very attractive uh, jurisdiction, uh, both in terms of OPEX and CAPEX. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the two headlines are both there. Okay. Um, would you say that it's sort of a re emergence or resurgence, sorry? in mining in these particular regions um, and who supports this and why and also i mean would you say mining obviously you said they've been mining for for many many years um would you say that it's just becoming more the the news flow is becoming a little bit more and people knowing more about this and has the sort of mining been pretty steady over the last few decades Actually, Rob, I think I think there's a really, really fundamental point there, um, and I, I think there's a I think there's a European story, uh, and not just a Balkans one or any other uh, else is. I think let's be honest, uh, in, a, in the Industrial Revolution, as Europe started to industrialize and its demand for raw materials started increasing exponentially, we, the great European powers, outsourced our natural resources requirements quite naturally to our dominions and our our, uh, our wider empire. You know, why dig for copper in Europe when you can go and get copper out of the, uh, out of Africa? Why produce iron ore when we've got Australia producing phenomenal quantities of iron ore? So we actually had a very interesting sort of couple of hundred years where there wasn't frankly much European mining, uh, with the exception of some of the eastern uh, former eastern states where they were within again those planned economies doing it. But across in Western Europe, I think there was actually a sort of a, 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 that divorce we talked about earlier of understanding the requirement for raw materials to feed our manufacturing. Uh, and I think that's been the place for, for a long time, but I think that is changing. Um, and of course, there's a subset to that, that actually, of course, Europe is bizarrely probably the place, particularly Western Europe, where there's been the greatest lack of modern geological exploration and endeavor in the world. And I think you know, that is part of the story that we're starting to see that play out with what's happening in Iberia, the Iberian Peninsula, with what's happening up in Scandinavia or Ireland, or in our case, the Balkans. But I think the more important point is, is that I think over the, over the last four or five years, and actually I was fortunate enough to be involved in this because I was a, an advisor to something called the Raw Materials Initiative at the European Union for a number of years. Uh, the, the European Union has become increasingly aware of the potential for resource scarcity, resource fragility in its supply chain. Going back to that point that actually, you know, we don't produce many primary resources in Europe, we're reliant on the rest of the world. And when one's reliant on the rest of the world, and uh, you are then for, uh, also utterly at the rest of the world sort of not whim exactly, but in, you know, in this, the times we move into when we're seeing almost deglobalization, when we're seeing the trade wars between America and China, when we're seeing an isolations in America pulling out and changing the sort of the global supply chain systems that we've all got so used to do. We've got Europe sitting there going, well, if we're going to protect our manufacturing base, if we're going to get that EV green revolution that we're all committing to in 2030, 2040, whatever it is, that absolutely needs primary raw materials to fuel it, 
Uh, we can't just be reliant on everyone else to do this. We need a seat at the table. Yeah, it's a bit like being uh, having a seat at the table on OPEC. You don't need to produce 100% of your oil, uh, but actually, if you can produce 10% of it and get that seat at OPEC, if you can have that resilience in your supply chain to at least have some access to primary resources yourself to allow you to ride out a period of uh, turbulence, to ride out a period of scarcity, to maintain your manufacturing base during that period of time, then you are future-proofing yourself and hedging against those issues. And of course, COVID's just smashed a rail and, you know, coach and horses through this. Mm. Yeah, we saw the global shipping uh, systems that had been working so well for decades and decades and decades almost fall apart. You know, I was talking to the shippers the other day, they've got shipping containers in the wrong ports all over the world. And I was talking to someone, who was a guy from Mask, who said it's going to take four months at the end of COVID just to correct the imbalance in the shipping system, which of course we know has actually led into our ability to maintain our manufacturing base. So that was a rather reversed way of sort of going to your question, which is that actually, I think that there is a resurgence in European mining. And I think that is actually based on a fundamental understanding of both the European Union and the European manufacturing countries that we need to secure our future supply to the critical materials that are gonna power our green revolution. And one of the ways of doing that is by leveraging our own natural resources. I mean, I could go as far to say, I think there's even within Europe, a notion that actually, you know, there was a slight moral question of how long one could continue to exploit natural resources around the rest of the world and not be uh, exploiting one's own. Uh, and, I, and I know that sounds a very liberal idea, but that is the sort of the way Europe thinks. And, you know, as a miner and a homegrown European miner, I'm utterly delighted by that. And so when I hear the European Union talking about the circular economy and about the, the green revolution and about the requirement for European manufacturing to lead the world in that, I'm delighted because I very much see our part as a homegrown European miner in, in fulfilling that aspiration of the European Union. Yeah. Um, and as a conclusion, just wondered if you can sort of um, brief, briefly give us an overview of the region and obviously the future uh, of, and over, obviously probably over the next five or 10 years maybe, um, of the actual region, what you forecast or what you see happening. Um, and also give us an overview of what Adriatic is up to over the coming years? Yeah, and a good question. I think, I, I think it's going to be a, an example of cause and effect. I think what we're going to see is the governments in the region seeing the development of mining projects by Adriatic, by Rio Tinto, by Zinjin, and by the others, and seeing the immediate impact that has on the economy, seeing both local and, and national as well, mm. and seeing the results of actually supporting the natural resources sector. And the cause and effect of that will be is I think we'll see increasing liberalization uh, of the laws and the codes and an increasing alignment with international standards of which there is way there is quite a long way to go. Uh, and I think uh, and then that will become a, a self fulfilling sort of prophecy whereby with liberalization with alignment with international codes we will see more investments because there's the geological potential for it. And then I think we'll see that burgeoning and growing and growing uh, and I think uh, the reality of successful FDI in this sector will play through very quickly into uh, the, the lawmakers uh, in the countries. I think we will see, also by dent of our own success, we'll see labour cost inflation. Uh, you know, let's be honest, if, if we are employing hundreds of people in Yadar in Serbia, there is going to be labour cost inflation for geologists. It's a good time to be a geologist in the Balkans. It's a fantastic time to be uh, graduating from university there. So I think all of us will start to see our, our traditionally quite low labour costs increase. But again, we expect that and we can hedge against that. I'd like to think that actually we'll see sort of consolidation by the majors in the region as they show more and more attention. Um, you know, there are still quite a lot of privately owned mines. There are still state owned mines. Uh, Kosovo, uh, the Trepture complex in Kosovo is still state owned. And uh, the political situation in Kosovo hasn't settled enough yet for someone to go in, but we're getting closer. And so I think you'll see uh, further privatizations and consolidation uh, by, the, by the major mining companies. Uh, and then alongside all that, increased exploration. Uh, there is a lot more to do. Uh, and I think that will be the narrative going forward, particularly, actually, I'll highlight two countries, Kosovo, uh, where there's been very little activity, uh, and Bosnia, where we've discussed earlier. In terms of Adriatic, uh, we are focused absolutely on deploying Varish. Uh, we are 
moving through the permitting schedule, uh, we're currently actually uh, entering in the debt raising. Uh, we look forward to raising debt in the summer of next year to start development of the project uh, towards the end of next year and go into full operations in 2023. And we've got a very clear route to, that, to do that uh, and a very clear route to debt given the financials of the company and where we're sitting today. Uh, and I'm delighted that we're, we're having conversations with people now about preparing for that very exciting part of the, of the transition. And then I think what's really attractive for Adriatic is the fact that behind that, we've got our new acquisition in Serbia, in Rashka, that can probably broadly follow about two years behind the development of our Bosnian project and then be financed actually out of the cash flow we produced in Serbia. So we've got a really wonderful opportunity to actually set ourselves up uh, from uh, developer explorer into producer one, producer two. And therefore what we've got to do over the next year or two is find asset three, asset four, asset five and continue our, our growth and success story, hopefully. Yeah, well, it certainly seems an exciting, um, definitely exciting region and exciting times for Adriatic. Uh, moving forward and uh, there seems to be a lot of scope in the area um, if our audience wants to reach out to you and obviously find out a little bit more if they've got any questions uh, around the region um, or any questions around Adriatic if they want to find some more um, information out about the company how can they uh, go about doing that uh, well, I think the easy way probably find me at, find me on LinkedIn Dominic Roberts Adriatic and we'll start off from there but I'd be delighted yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it, it is my favourite subject and I'd be delighted if someone uh, showed an interest to, you know, in any of the points I brought up or just a, a more general uh, inquiry about Adriatic and our story or, or the region. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. very much so. Please do. And are you on any social media at all? You, yourself or the company? Uh, company is on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, uh, I am a, a observer of Twitter. Uh, I monitor it uh, and enjoy very much see, seeing what some of the fin twits uh, to say about us. It's positive. Um, <laughs> no, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, on all of those. But uh, come get hold of me. Find me on, uh, find me on uh, LinkedIn and we'll pick up the conversation from there. Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, and all those will be in the show notes accompanies the podcast. Um, also, if you want to um, uh, email myself, I can pass any messages on to Dominic. And if you want to email me, it's rob at mining-international.org or rob at digdeeptheminingpodcast.com. Either, uh, either of those email addresses, any questions will come straight to me anyway. So really appreciate your time, Dominic. That's a great overview of especially the region um, that many people might not know um, much about mining in the Balkans. And I certainly gave a brilliant account of, of the region. Um, and uh, there certainly seems to be a lot of um, exciting opportunities for the future uh, for the region and for the Adriatic. So I um, wish you well for the future. And the audience, appreciate you uh, listening. Um, hope you enjoyed the episode. Um, please share this episode to anyone that you feel that can benefit from listening to uh, what Dominic's had to say about the Balkans. Um, appreciate if you could just, yeah, just share this podcast out to friends, colleagues, other people within the mining industry that um, shows a, sh can show an interest in the Balkans and the mining industry, uh, that'd be appreciated. And until next time, happy mining.